All right. So today we're here for a community of practice talking about what is assistive technology. Um, assistive technology is one of those areas in the IEP that often is not as looked at as, you know, your present levels, your goals. Um, and yet it is so, so vital to completing those um, that it is just absolutely vital that we look at. So assistive technology is there's the nice, um, you know, definitions that we all use, but really when it comes down to it, we are looking at services and technology. So services and devices. And so our services are listed here. Um, so these are things like our evaluations, um, purchasing the device, getting the device so that student can actually access their curriculum being able to you know, coordinate their therapies and being able to teach and train the communicate or the you know, teachers and aides and therapists how to use that assistive technology device. Um, and then obviously, you know, if that device gets broken, how are we gonna get it fixed? How are we gonna get it repaired? Um, and so all of those are services that assistive technology entails. So assistive technology also includes devices. Um, and it includes lots of different devices with lots of different areas. Um, and so I'm a speech language pathologist. So my first go-to is always assistive or alternative and augmentative communication. However, that is not all that AT is. Um, and so that's really important for people to remember. Um, because I know it's what a lot of people think of first, but it's not all that AT is. AT is so, so much more. Um, so we have areas of cognition and academic, and these are academic and learning aids. So you get your, your you know, very specific calculators that some kids need. Some kids need like a talking calculator. Um, this can also be things like being able to have spell check and being able to have your modified books. Um, so really, I mean, there's so much in there and not just for reading supports, but also for math. Like I was talking about those calculators. And I mean, there's so many great programs out there online that really support mathematics as well. Um, and then there's also your cognitive aids. So this is a lot of times for students who struggle with your executive functioning issues. Um, so these are things like calendars and, you know, being able to really dig into some of those really cool tools that are out there um, for executive functioning. Um, I just saw one the other day that was literally like you put in a task and it will automatically break it down task by task by task. And I was like, well, this is super cool. So I made it plan my vacation for me because um, <laughs> why not? Um, so that's cognitive and academic. There is a ton of resources that are involved in that area. Um, everything. It's so much. It's very, very small on this piece of paper, but it is such a large topic. Um, then we go into adaptive. Um, so adaptive covers your aids for daily living, which um, are things like your adapted utensils. You know, if you just put on a foam piece of a piece of foam onto a utensil that can make that grip bigger so then it's easier to hold for a student with um, motor difficulties um, and lots of uh, and I, I think a lot of um, PTs and OTs in the schools are thinking about toileting um, as well and so how to make sure that you know students are safe um, while toileting. Um, then access to computers and other electronic aids. Um, this is huge. Um, partnering, especially with like your STEM classroom and your uh, tech, tech classrooms, um, which is pretty much every classroom now because um, we all like to use our Chromebooks and whatnot. Um, and so making sure that students have access to keyboards that they can use, um, you know, touch screens used to be a huge form of assistive technology. And now it's just everyday technology, which is a beautiful thing. Um, but, you know, making sure that students who need that technology have it. 
Um, and then we have environmental controls, um, making sure that you know students can access their environment. Um, a lot of um, classrooms that I know of um, are actually starting to include some smart home devices that I can't say or else mine will activate. Um, <laughs> so that's fun um, and a really cool way to include some environmental control within the classroom as well. And then another adaptive area is also support for low vision. Um, so when you have students who have low vision, there are lots of different things we can do. Some of them are um, things like magnifiers and, you know, um, there's lots of different kinds of magnifiers out there. Um, but you can also do things like high contrast paper and colored overlays and specialized glasses. There's so much vision wise. Um, and looking at vision as well, looking at some of those computer access things, looking at how to access the computer, there are lots of built-in vision supports into our uh, operating systems now. So again, AT covers a lot of things. A lot of them play together. Um, and so when we're thinking about vision, we also need to be thinking about computer access. Um, and there's lots of areas of overlap within for these specific students. For communication, again, my heart. Um, the first one is assistive listening devices and environmental aids um, for hearing. And so that is a very large area in the schools as well. Um, and there are multiple options for amplification within the school, within your classroom. Um, lots of looking at, you know, a lot of teachers over COVID started using amplification devices, which is beautiful. Love that that's becoming more common. Um, but there are lots of different systems we can use within our classrooms for assistive listening. Um, you know, we can look at closed captioning for our videos making sure, and these are simple things, right? These don't, AT doesn't have to be super high tech. It can be as simple as hitting the closed captioning button when you are using a YouTube video, um, which is just really neat. And I love that it's becoming more and more prevalent in our everyday lives. And then there's alternate, augmentative and alternative communication, which is for students who need a little extra support in their communication. Um, and this is really anything from, you know, we're looking at these pictures and we're exchanging these pictures to I'm hitting a button and it's saying, I have something to say, or I want this. Um, and then all the way to speech generating devices, which are, um, you know, robust language systems that really, you know, can take a student all the way. Um, and also looking at uh, students who might use uh, text-to-speech as their primary alternative communication is also an option. Um, so that would fall under AAC as well, and also probably computer access and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so again, there's lots of interplay. Um, and when you're looking at AAC, you also need to look at your hearing considerations and your vision considerations and all of that. So it all really does work together. Some other areas um, that we include are physical, right? And there are lots of different things we need to consider in the physical realm. Um, fine motor is a huge one, right? We need to be able to access our world with, with our hands. Um, and if not, we need to figure out ways to access our world. Um, and so there are lots of different fine motor, motor tools. Um, some of them are really simple that we may not necessarily think of when we're writing that IEP, but can be really vital for that student. So things like pencil grips or, you know, adapted scissors, things like that. Some of those, again, are not like, ooh, these are expensive high-tech things, but they are really, really important for that student to be able to access their curriculum. Um, the next section is mobility aids. Um, and mobility aids are things so that they can get around their, cl their classroom and their schools. A lot of PTs are thinking about this. So these are things like your um, wheelchairs and your gait trainers and your walkers and all those sorts of mobility um, aids that we need in order to get around the school. 
Seating and positioning is related to mobility a lot of times, but it, it can also be separated out. And so there we're looking at, you know, a lot of times in the schools we have, you know, lots of classrooms have moved to a, you know, adapted seating where they can move around the classroom and change their seating from the beanbag chair to the chair to the, you know, the cool stool to the wobble disc or whatever. Um, that's all adapted seating. Um, and sometimes we really, for our students with IEPs, we need to really be thinking about that adapted seating. Um, and it might be more involved than it is for your typical classroom. Um, so we might be looking at making sure, you know, our feet are supported and the wheelchair has the features that it needs. Now we're not necessarily being the ones doing the wheelchair assessment, right? But we need to make sure that that we are aware of why um, that chair is set up the way it is. Um, social emotional area, um, recreation, leisure, and play. Um, our kids with IEPs deserve to play just as much as our, you know, kids in gen ed. Um, and so there are lots and lots of really cool things out there in the assistive tech world that are for recreation. Um, and this isn't just talking about littles, it goes all the way through high school into adulthood. Um, so we're talking, you know, for board games, there's dice that you can do online and you can have them hit the buzzer or hit the switch and roll the dice. Um, there's adapted sports equipment and that is like super cool stuff right there. Um, I've seen people hook up a uh, PVC, thing in front of a wheelchair to push the soccer ball so they can play soccer with their friends. Um, just lots of really cool stuff. Um, and then, so lots of cool stuff for, for PE teachers that they can help um, incorporate students into their, into their classroom or their gym. Um, and then just looking at, you know, playground accessibility and things like that as well is, is captured in that category. Um, and then the last part um, that's on this is transportation aid use and access aids. So making sure that our students can get to and from school appropriately, you know, sometimes this is a specialized bus um, and, you know, lifts and all that sort of stuff. Um, and sometimes it is, especially when we're thinking about our transition kids in high school, it's thinking about, well, how are we gonna help them safely and efficiently move around their environment when they're, you know, doing their, voc you know, their next placement. Um, where are they going to be when they're an adult? Do they know how to access, you know, the bus? Do they know? And there are really cool softwares that um, kind of coordinate with GPS in order to um, give some video modeling of, you know, how do I ride the bus? How do I know when it's my stop? Things like that. Um, so there's just some really neat um, technology out there. And honestly, it gets better every single day. Um, and there's new stuff all the time. And so it's really hard to keep up with. But at the same time, if you know the general categories of things that you can look for, it becomes a lot less overwhelming. Because um, as you want to learn about something, you can then have some of that vocabulary of, oh, I need to look here. This is what I'm looking for, um, which makes it a little less overwhelming. So that is a general overview of assistive technology and what it is and some categories that you may look at. Yeah, and I wanted to jump in and kind of just point out on this, these are the five major domains that are recognized by the Tennessee Department of Ed. There are other smaller subdomains that could go on and on when you're looking at AT across the lifespan, but we're not looking at adult uh, vocational, uh, home life, the sorts of things that are much, you know, beyond the high school level. So these are the five domains and then this actually is a document that was created by the Department of Ed and adopted um, for use in the school system. It's meant to remind staff that when you put one of these or any number of these tools into place for a student, they have, it has to be recognized on their IEP as 
they require assistive technology. Sometimes we take for granted that we have Chromebooks with Chrome accessibility on them. Oh, all of my kids have the option of having their text read aloud to them. Well, that's a cognitive academic domain example. And just because it's universally available to all students, that's terrific. But that doesn't mean we don't add it to an IEP, because if it is required for that student with a learning disability, and, and it's not required for the student sitting next to him, that student doesn't have an IEP, and this student does. It must be added to that IEP as a tool that is beneficial to that particular student. And this, this is sometimes where we see the districts don't have um, a lot of assistive technology indicated on their um, number of their students' IEPs. And it's not that they aren't giving it to them. They just aren't sure or even aware of that it needs to be added in writing because it seems so common. You've given them a special chair to sit in. Well, that was nice and it fit their needs. If you don't write it down, it doesn't get carried over to the next classroom or maybe doesn't transition up to the junior high or the high school with them, or even between grade levels. If they move to another district, the next district needs to know that they were using that so that it, time isn't wasted on finding out all over again that, oh, they needed weighted pencils. Oh, they need a slant board. Oh, they need a small magnifier to have at their desk for fine print. Oh, they need to have their text-to-speech turned on. So it's little things like that that are being used by fabulous teachers and clinicians everywhere not always being made note in the IEP. And that's one of our goals is to make sure we help people recognize that if you're using it, you need to document. So that's kind of my take on that. 